Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I'm so psyched that you are here. I really want to call this more like a friendship jam with my friend, Rob Mack. I want to tell you about Rob. He has this beautiful book called Love from the Inside Out, Lessons and Inspiration for Loving Yourself, Your Life, and Each Other. And wow, this is a time when we could really use a bunch more love. But this is the second time Rob has been on the show. I find him so interesting. After the first time, we actually became friends. So I'm gonna, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's an Ivy League educated positive psychology expert, celebrity happiness coach, executive coach, and author. So with Rob, what he became really well known for, he's really the world's leading expert on the relationship between happiness and success. Right? He helps individuals and organizations achieve an energizing balance of authentic personal happiness and effortless professional success based on time-tested, face-valid, empirical data, and timeless, transcendental wisdom. So what we've been talking about and what we talked about in this book is all about love, right? How do we source it for ourselves? How do we create more of it in the world? How do we stay positive without being hyper positive? How do we take care of ourselves in this rough time? Because it has been a rough time. Anyway, this again, it's a little bit more like a friendship conversation. I hope that you guys enjoy it. Everything you need to know about Rob's book and all the stuff are in the show notes. So I hope that you love this interview with Rob Mack as much as I loved interviewing him. I'm so excited to welcome my pal, Rob Mack, to The Terry Cole Show. Or should I say back to The Terry Cole Show? Is this the first time you're on, Rob, or is this the second time? I think it's the second. Yeah. I just think it on here enough. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Uh, all right, so let's talk about you. You have love from the inside out, lessons and inspiration for loving yourself, your life, and each other. And the paperback came out relatively recently in the last couple of months. So you guys, you can get this anywhere. Fine books are sold by the fantastic author and positive psychology expert, Rob Mack, called Love from the Inside Out. Now let's talk a little bit about love, right? Right now we're living in a hard time. And how, how do we, how can we give us some advice, your thoughts about how do we tap into or stay tapped into our loving inside self when the world is in such turmoil, you know? Oh, it's such a good question. A question. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. I think that ultimately love for me means peaceful aliveness. So, you know, in the best of times and the worst of times, there is still life running through our body, you know, through our lives. And so we want to tap into that sort of felt experience of life inside of us, that peaceful aliveness that always exists inside, even when things seem to be going horribly awry or wrong, even when you're not having the best day or the best year, or the best life, <laughs> you still can tap into this peaceful aliveness that exists um, not only with you, but sort of as you. Um, so we, we we often think about ourselves as human beings and physical beings, but you know there's something that's aware of um, our physicality, that's aware of our emotions, that's aware of our thoughts, um, but that isn't our thoughts or emotions or any of those things. So anyway, that awareness, that consciousness, um, is life itself, and so filling into that sort of felt sense of your oneness with that life is what I call love. You can call it peace. You can call it happiness. Um, but you want to do it as consistently as humanly possible. And it does help to have moments when you're not thinking about and certainly not obsessing about everything that's going on in the world and even your life, which can be very difficult. So you need some time set aside just to practice peace and love and happiness by tapping into this infinite source of it that exists inside you. Mm, I love it. So if we go back to the phrase, peaceful aliveness. So for many of us and myself included part of my meditation practice part of my physical fitness practice part of just the way that i live my life is i'm always seeking to hold on to the peaceful aliveness and it's e i find it easier especially in times of stress to not be able to hold on to it and that to have to be even more um sort of disciplined and it's a gift of course that we give ourselves a daily meditation practice or anything that creates internal stillness and silence is a gift 
But would you tell us a little bit about your own practices so that you can sort of stay dialed into that peaceful aliveness within yourself? Yeah. So I'd say that um, early in my life, I had no practice at all. <laughs> That's why I was so depressed and suicidal and self-hating and self-loathing and often would probably project that onto other people. Um, and then after that, I discovered sports. And for me, it was running. I mean, running for me was something that my father forced me to do to run cross country. But in his infinite wisdom, it turned out to be one of those activities in which I could always experience this peaceful aliveness that I, at the time, only called flow state. You know, when you're mm -hmm. so tapped in, tuned in, turned on to what you're doing, that you don't have a whole lot of interest in evaluating how you're doing. Right. And so there's a loss of time consciousness, a loss of self consciousness, and you're just so consumed and absorbed and engaged in what you're doing and enjoying it so much um, that you find that you're more productive and creative and efficient and effective doing it. So for me, it was sports, you know, it was mm -hmm. cross country and then and basketball sometimes. Um, now it's different. You know, um, I love the idea. I still run, uh, but I love the idea of not needing to put my body through so much physical <laughs> pain in order to experience um, this peaceful aliveness inside. And so I have um, two practices, really. Um, one is uh, micro meditation. So micro meditation is just one breath that you take for joy's sake or peace's sake or love's sake alone. So just to enjoy it. So you take this one breath and you pretend like it's the last breath and the last moment you'll ever get on this planet. You know, you never know what could be. So it's good to be sincere about it. Mm -hmm. And as you take that breath, you take it in through your nose. You let your stomach expand more than it normally would. Breathe out of your mouth. You let your stomach contract or flatten back out more than it normally would. Let all your thoughts go, and you do it simply for the joy of it. You try to juice that one breath for as much joy as you can possibly get out of it. And you can do that, and I do that, as frequently as I can remember throughout the day, no matter what else I'm doing, be folding clothes or swiffering in a conversation. But I do it intentionally, and I do it in a pretty disciplined way, but I mostly do it for joy's sake. Mm. And what happens is it prevents that snowball effect of stress and anxiety that sort of builds up during the day that prevents you from being able to sleep or, you know, just really enjoy life. I love the idea of micro meditations, because I think that for a lot of folks, if you're listening or watching this on YouTube and you're like, I want to meditate, but I can't. What Rob just shared is something that really we can all do. <laughs> no matter how much of a meditator you're not, you, you're breathing anyway. So you might as well do it with intention. And maybe we can collectively do um, an experiment for what if we did it for four days straight, where throughout those days, we just put a timer on our phone and we thought once an hour, I'm going to do this breathing exercise and we'll drop all this in the show notes, you guys, but to just see what would happen to my internal state. If I did that, how would my frame, the lens through which I see the world, how would that change? Because for my, myself with a meditation practice, it was something that was incredibly elusive for me for many years. Even when I was a talent agent long before I became a psychotherapist, I knew instinctively that I needed it. Like I was very drawn to Vedic wisdom and all kinds of yoga and all kinds of stuff around meditation. But I, I kept being like, maybe I could do a weekend intensive. I'm going to get it if I do that, or I'm going to do like, I've always wanted like the New York city shortcut, you know, that's what I was seeking. And yet when I finally learned and we, you and I, right before we went live, we're talking about my friend, my soul brother, David G, who ended up, he was my meditation teacher at, um, I, I did actually do an intensive weekend, but it stuck this time. And there were two things he said that really impacted me. One was that like, do it for 21 days. So he taught us how to meditate. We did primordial sound meditation where you get your own mantra based on your time, date, uh, longitude and latitude of your birth. It is supposedly the sound the universe was making the moment you were born. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I know that in all the years I've been meditating, I've never told anyone my mantra because you're not supposed to, not even my husband. Um, and he was like, listen, 
when you're done here. Do it for 21 days. If you don't like it, never do it again. And of course, he knows <laughs> once you do it for 21 days, you're going to keep doing it. And that was like 20 years ago. Um, and another thing, maybe two more things, but another thing that he said was, you know, it's like, let it be easy, right? It's sort of like um, mist floating up off of a lake. Like visualize the way that you're breathing. Like he had all these beautiful visuals that were really helpful and, and really tips to be successful. Like he had, you know, rise, pee, meditate, RPM, right? Just do it. You're sort of in that state between sleeping and waking. And it's like, it's your defenses are not up yet as much. It's easier or raw right after work was the other acronym. Don't try to do it at night, obviously, because before I know it, you're going to be sleeping and that's going to be like meditation and sleep becomes synonymous. But anyway, long way around the barn to get back to. We were talking about that um, peaceful aliveness. What I found when I finally got a dedicated practice is that it wasn't just the peaceful aliveness that I experienced. It was, it gave me reaction time. So in all of my, my uh, interactions throughout the day, I was kind of a bit of a hothead, a little bit, kind of an Aries. You know, if you were into Ayurvedic stuff, I'd be like a out of balance pitta, you know, like where you're like, everything is now like very impatient. <laughs> right? oh. And I noticed that suddenly I had about two to three seconds additional response time, which meant that I had the option to not hit that like bitchy email I was going to send or that mean text or whatever the thing was like, there was this emotional self-regulation, this, this muscle that came from doing that that I, it really changed my life, which is why then, you know, meditation became one of the cornerstones of my therapy practice. And then I have meditation CDs that came out when people still cared about CDs. Anyway, it, it was a whole, a whole process of bringing it all back around to what you were just sharing that you don't have to have a dedicated practice that is 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes right after work. You can do what you just shared, Rob, with the micro meditations. But what I'm inviting the people watching or listening to do is to do something that will counter the, what we've been dealing with for the past, not just two years, certainly two years, but years before that too, there's been a lot of, um, conflict, pain in the world, suffering that we are witness to. Um, so I have another question for you from the positive psychology point of view, because this is also your expertise is when, if someone has a tendency to be pessimistic, let's say, cause I hear from a lot of people online that they're, you know, people emailing me, they're, they're just, they feel depressed. They're feeling hopeless. So I don't know if there's any tips that you have or thoughts that you have about how can we hold on to hope in a time that feels a little hopeless? Yeah, it's such a powerful question. Um, and it's one I've thought a lot about. And it's one I've suffered with really and struggle with a lot. Um, you know, the truth is for me is that um, there, there are no al other alternatives that are very constructive or constructive at all. And so if you care about your subjective well-being, meaning that you want to experience your own peace, love and happiness, and you want to be a force for good in the world, um, there is no other option, <laughs> right? Um, you know, emotions are contagious. We know that emotions are the most contagious element on the planet, um, more contagious than any virus um, or infection. Uh, you can pass it through a screen. You can pass it 3,000 miles away. Um, you know, away. You can pass it with a simple glance, right? People can catch it. You can infect people with it. So that's the first piece. Um, you know, how do you go about doing that? Well, I'd say, you know, Mr. Rogers often had the best advice, and he would say, look for the helpers, Look for the helpers, right? So there are people in the world now, Terry, you're one of them. I hope to be one of them. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, hopefully millions of people that are helping each in their own little way, in their own little corner of the world. Um, some in a, at a larger scale, some at seemingly a smaller scale. But those sort of behaviors and um, the energy they're putting out has ripple effects across the world. And so, you know, the key is to look for the helpers. Um, the second uh, key is to vet your thoughts and or conversations, so the ones you have with yourself and the, and the one you have with others, 
not based exclusively and only on whether or not those thoughts and conversations are true. There are lots of things that are true that by focusing on them, you will not feel better and you want to help the world do better. Instead, vet those thoughts and conversations with yourself and others based also on whether or not they're helpful and constructive. And so that means you have to be a selective sifter and sorter of mm -hmm. what is helpful, what is supportive, what is constructive in terms of you and other people and the world achieving what it is that you want to achieve or you want the world to achieve or you want other people to achieve. Sometimes all we're after is a feeling and that's perfectly fine. In fact, I'd say that's probably one of the highest demonstrations or manifestations um, to make. Uh, but the key there is look for the helpers and then you've got to focus on those thoughts and those conversations that are constructive and supportive with respect to what you want to achieve, accomplish, acquire, feel, or experience. Mm. So good. And it's so true. And I think that part of what at least I find with myself, if my self care isn't great, like if I let myself get run down, if I'm not sleeping enough, if I'm not working out the way that I like to, because it makes me feel good, I have a much more of a tendency to sort of fall into that a pit of despair about what's going on rather than what you're saying. Because looking for the helpers is something that doesn't cost any money. It's something that all of us can do. And I definitely do this in the way that I vet the social media that I consume, the way that I consume news. If any, I don't, I don't ever watch it because it's so traumatizing to me, but I read it. I read the New York times. I read time magazine every week. Like, but I, I want to have control over what, what is going in to my body and into my mind. Um, on social media, I've, found so many positive accounts of people randomly, random acts of kindness, um, joyful, just people being amazing. Because I think that there's this tendency because it's what sells things and they want people, you know, clickbait and people, they want you to come through and see the horrible thing for some reason, because of the way we're wired as humans. You know, it's like the accident, you you know, the rubbernecking effect. You don't want to look, but you can't stop, you know. Um, and we can do the same thing with more positive, right? Absolutely. You nailed it. And it's such a great point you make, which is that, you know, look, the brain is designed and wired for survival, not necessarily happiness. Okay. But if you survive, <laughs> it's a lot easier to be happy, at least in these physical bodies, right? <laughs> so the brain is looking out for you. And part of the way it looks out for us is through a negativity bias and a confirmation bias and behavior confirmation, all these biases and distortions, cognitive distortions we have going on in our heads. It's just a sort of big way of saying that the, there's an incredible algorithm in your head that's always at work. And it's partly designed to look for problems in order to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that there are these folks in the world and we'll call them availability entrepreneurs, but people who sort of actively and intentionally take advantage of this negativity bias and this confirmation bias in your head. And so the long and short of it is that you get more of what you look for, right? So if you can look for things that make you feel better when you look at them or focus on them, if you can begin to entertain conversations with yourself and others in ways that are constructive and supportive and also true. So in other words, how can you tell a better feeling story about everything and everybody in the world, starting with yourself, that is also based in truth. Because if it's not based in truth, it won't be believable. And it's not believable, it won't be very helpful, right? So it can be both. You can optimize for both truth and better feeling, right? So the better feeling story based in truth. Yeah, I think you make a really important point about it being based in truth, because I think that one um, complaint people have, or mis maybe misperception um, or misconception of, um, positive psychology and other, and other things like it is like, oh, it's just about bypassing problems, blah, 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 right? It's like hyper positivity, which, what do you say to that? Yeah. You know, it's um, interesting. You're right. It's funny these days. Um, it's almost like if you put the word toxic in front of anything that we normally think of as a good thing, it suddenly gets, becomes quick bait material, right? So it's toxic positivity. And I get it. It's, you know, this, none of this, and I don't believe in pasting smelly stickers over empty gas tanks, so to speak. So it's not about it being a snow job. You don't want to fake yourself out or try to fake yourself out about it. Instead, it's looking for 
again, the constructive or supportive way to talk about whatever it is you're talking about or thinking about. So for instance, if it's raining outside, is it a bad day? Ugh, that's an additional judgment we don't need to add to it. It's raining, okay? And the better feeling story is, I sure do love sunny days and I sure I'm looking forward to the sunny days and tough days or rainy days sure make those sunny days that much sweeter, right? So it's the bitter that makes the sweet so sweet. And so you just want to sort of begin to play and exercise um, and flex that particular muscle more and more. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And then one day it becomes automatic. And I'm a testament to that because I was the most pessimistic, skeptical, you know, um, Debbie Downer in the world, you know, was, <laughs> you know, was Robert Downer, and it was a real problem. And I thought that I could never be anything other than that, that I was destined and wired to be that way. But I found that not only could I change the way in which I looked at my life and talked about my life and the world, but also I could feel better as a result of that. And I could, in a much more powerfully persuasive and influential way, encourage other people through my living, shining example to do the same, to be the same, and to speak in the same ways. And you'd be surprised that if you can just take the tiny little bite-sized steps that you spoke about earlier, Terry, it's amazing how much better we can get pretty quickly. And then we find that other people are beginning to catch on or um, you know, get on board as well. So let me ask you, Rob, where does gratitude come into this process of happiness? Because really you, you are a happiness expert, a love expert. There's lots of things you're an expert at, but where, where's gratitude in the mix of this? Yeah. So gratitude is just everything. And again, you want it to be authentic. There was a period in my life when I really struggled to be grateful. I mean, I had a great life, you know, I had um, health and I had a family. I had two beautiful German cars and I was making good money as a consultant and I was miserable, you know, so deeply miserable. And I felt not only um, frustrated uh, with my life and with this unhappiness. But when I try to be grateful for things that I should obviously be grateful for, like running water, a roof over my head, a safe place to live, I couldn't do it. I really struggled. And so I discovered that part of the challenge was that I was trying to force myself to feel grateful about things that I didn't genuinely feel that grateful about. Um, and I was not looking and sort of being grateful for things that were much easier for me to great, you know, feel gratitude around. So for instance, uh, you know, a beautiful woman passes by, I can feel lots of gratitude for that or mm. a beautiful sunset. I could actually feel lots of gratitude for that. Or the fact that I got off of work and I didn't have to work, you know, an additional three or four hours that one day that was real gratitude. And so gratitude is absolutely critical. And really it's another word for love. It's just a question of focusing on, what it is about your life or yourself or other people that you love. What do you love? Can you focus on what you love or what you enjoy? And if you can do that more consistently and do it in an authentic way, it does become automatic. You do rewire your brain in about 22 to 66 days, as you mentioned earlier, to make that kind of approach to life much less effortful and a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, it's, it's true. And I think that you're making this great point about finding the things that it's, if you're starting a gratitude practice, like consciously, right? That finding the things where you sort of spontaneously feel grateful for, like you said, a beautiful woman passing by, that would create a sort of a spontaneous feeling of like, wow, I appreciate the way this person looks or whatever. I, Vic and I about a year ago started because it was a rough time, right? For everyone, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago, but you know, my mom had been sick, the pandemic, we were still locked down and the book, there were so many things that were happening in my life that I should have been grateful for, but I felt so overwhelmed. And I found myself, cause I'm pretty naturally a pretty positive person. I found myself sort of focusing more on the negative. And I was like, Hey, let's, let's try this thing that I read about. Let's just at night, we're going to do three gratitudes and like our favorite frame of the day. And we've been doing it consistently. And what ends up happening is that I noticed that we have a very healthy, good, joyful, mutual relationship, but the amount of keeping the gratitude right on the surface, because it wasn't just gratitude for each other. It was like, what am I grateful for in this day? And it's similar to what you were saying before, where maybe it is a day where it rained, but I'm grateful. I don't have to water the vegetable garden. 
right? There's, we're finding things to be grateful for. And then the, the frame of the day, it makes you, it's almost like, um, Deepak will, I've done a whole bunch of work with him, will teach you to recapitulate your day, right? Go back over your day. Think about, you know, before you go to sleep, like how, how was all, how were all the things of the day? But it's so easy to just get up, burn through the day, drop, as my friend David G would say, and then do it all over again, where I find that that gratitude practice that we've been doing creates this pause for expansion into more gratitude. And of course, what you, what you look for, you find, as you said, and what you focus your attention on grows, right? Yes, Terry. I mean, gosh, there's so much gold in that. And uh, we could spend all day all week <laughs> unpacking all of it truly. And a couple of things I want to highlight that I thought were just so powerful and poignant. Um, one is you're right. The gratitude sort of lends or leads to a pause or increasing presence. And in that presence, you find more gratitude, right? The mm -hmm. presence is the present. It is a gift. And in that gift is more gratitude. And it just has to, sometimes we just have to unwrap that gift by looking more closely um, in that moment or your day. It also works the other way, right? So the gratitude can lead to presence, but presence can lead to gratitude. So when I was really struggling, I found that if the, the least I could do was not continue to harp on and beat the drum of everything that was going wrong in my life or the world. Okay. Like I was like, okay, maybe I can't be grateful, but I can certainly not be such a complainer like, <laughs> at the very least. Right. And yeah. what's interesting is that's also, so that key or cheat code, which works for gratitude also works for self-love. I mean, gratitude is a synonym really for love and self-love is just, you know, sort of channeling or focusing on yourself and looking for what you're grateful about or appreciate within yourself. And I found that if I could, at the, Worst case scenario, I could keep my eyes and focus and attention off of all the things about myself that I didn't love or wasn't grateful for, and just focus on the one or two things that I was grateful for that I did love or appreciate about myself. Pretty soon, as I continued to keep that process up and I kept the gratitude journal in order to do that, I found that after a period of time, I would look back at these things that were previously and seemingly unlovable that I could feel no gratitude for at all. And I felt love and gratitude even for those things, things that before I thought were flaws or major failures or foibles of some kind. And so this is the beautiful, powerful, sort of contagious and infectious effect of love and uh, gratitude practice. You know, so you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it in bite-sized pieces. Definitely focus on what you feel viscerally sort of grateful and um, loving around. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes focused there. And you'll be surprised that it starts to bleed in a positive way throughout everything else that's going on in your life in the world. It's pretty profound, that, actually. That is actually really, really powerful. And again, you know, part of Rob, what we're talking about and why I wanted you to come on and have this conversation is that we all need practices that we can do and actually still live our lives. And so, so many of the things that you've shared and so many of the things that we've talked about in this, uh, conversation today are things that people can do and people can get your book. That's for sure. You have other books, right? Love from the inside out. Here we go. This is it. You guys can get it anywhere. But I, I, my question for you, Rob, about love is why, why has this been the focus for you? You, you, th there's this, you are really committed to like, you're an expert on love and not the way people think like, only partnership love. It's really about love with a capital L. So tell us a little bit about what has drawn you to this, become an expert in love. Yeah. Wow. What a great question. Uh, so the truth is mostly because I failed at it so miserably so much of my life. Right. And I miss, and I've misunderstood it and I've uh, projected that uh, understanding into the world or other people, you know, ultimately, you know, when I started, uh, I had my practice, my private practice, I really want to just simply be a happiness coach, okay? Because that's what I struggled with the most. That's what I knew and was most intimately familiar with. But most people were calling me because they were having issues with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Either the lack of other people or other people that weren't behaving according, mm -hmm. you know, to their desires or expectations. Mm -hmm. And so quickly, I sort of became more known as a relationship and love coach, even though my heart was always on happiness. And I realized that in that process, yeah, there were so many myths and misconceptions around mm -hmm. what love is. And I think the major sort of misconception is that, to your point, um, that love is only or mostly 
an exclusive romantic relationship that we have with one other person when the truth is that love is an inclusive way of relating to all people and all living creatures, all sentient beings. And if you can only love one person, you can't love anyone, right? You don't really love anyone. Um, and so much of the love that we, that goes under the name, or goes or passes for, you know, love is really just pseudo love. It uh, mm -hmm. seems like us, it's love, but it's really just a demand, a negotiation, a business affair. It's an attempt to get something by giving something first. And it often becomes very manipulative and we don't always mean it that way. Um, but you know, you can see it in little ways. You let somebody in, you know, in front of you in traffic when you're driving and they don't say thank you, or you open the door for someone else and then you feel it. You're like, oh wow. And then you have to check yourself. Cause that happened to me. I have to open the door for people. And I believe in being polite. My mom and dad have always taught me to be that way. Mm -hmm. And I feel this little sting inside. Like, oh, they didn't even say thank you. Right. And then I thought, well, Rob, why did you hold the door? Did you hold the door for a thank you? Or did you hold the door because it felt so good to you to be able to give from a place of overflow, right? So the book really uh, has really been an attempt and an effort to clarify both for myself and for other people what love truly is and how infinitely available it is to all of us, whether or not we're in a relationship, whether or not we consider ourselves to have a lot of friends, whether or not we consider ourselves to be very spiritual or very evolved. This is something that is available to each of us at all points in times because it exists within us and as us. And so it's a little bit of an effort to help people see the ever present nature of love. So incredibly beautiful and so empowering. You know, Rob, what I love about this book is that it's basically saying, you know, stop looking outside of yourself for the magic or for the love because you're, it's coming from within the house, right? It, it is possible for us to fuel that fire within ourselves. And you brought up this really good point about what is our motivation for doing what we're doing? And of course, all of us fall into that thing. I let somebody in in traffic and if they don't acknowledge me at all, I am a little pit. Yes. Like I'm a little bit like, <laughs> for sure. Like why? But questioning, right? Being, being clear about what we're doing is so important and why, what is the motivation? I love the idea of giving without like giving anonymously, right? Doing acts of kindness and telling no one. And for me, because little ego driven little, you know, I've got all my stuff like everyone else in the beginning, that was hard to do. But the more I did it in my life, the more I realized, Oh, this is actually me giving because I want to giving from love, a state of equanimity, a state of true flow with how I want to contribute to the world. Because if I'm giving and then I want to put a friggin' billboard up about it, is that really <laughs> it? No, it's really not. So I, I love that you like clearly, clearly stated that Rob, tell everybody where they can find you, please. Yes. Yeah, so you can find me at coachrobmack.com. That's my website. You can find me on most all social media platforms, most consist consistently Instagram at Rob Mack, M -A -C -K, official. And you can find both my books, Happiness from the Inside Out and Love from the Inside Out, everywhere great books are sold, including Barnes and Noble and Amazon. This is the book, people. Love from the Inside Out, Lessons and Inspiration for Loving Yourself, Your Life, and Each Other. Wow, man, we need this more than ever. And Rob Mack, my friend, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It is always my pleasure. Oh, the honor and pleasure is always mine. Thank you so much, Terry.